The Philosophy of Praxis, Marx, Lucas, and the Frankfurt School by Andrew Feinberg, Chapter 9, Philosophy of Praxis, Summary and Significance, Introduction. In this concluding chapter, I begin with an analytical summary of the history of philosophy of praxis as a figure of thought. This has been our main concern throughout this book. But the philosophy of praxis raises questions for us today that do not have clear answers in this history. The later sections of this chapter consider two of these questions. Here's a brief preview of these sections. The failure of proletarian revolution has not ended the struggle against reification, but it has fragmented that struggle. How is the meta-critique of reification affected by that change? Reified rationality still prevails in society, and it is still mediated by tensions between its forms and the content of the life processes it shapes and constrains. But it is no longer plausible to envisage a final end of this condition. Reification in some form is an essential aspect of modernity. Both the successes and the failures of socialist revolution teach us that reified rationality as embodied in social institutions, will always confront suppressed potentialities, motivating transformation from below. This conflictual configuration is now the permanent state of modern society, but it does not at present take the form of general revolutionary struggle. Can the fragmented struggles of this historical period fulfill the program of philosophy of praxis? The answer to this question depends on the type of practice that is supposed to resolve the antinomies. If that practice is conceived as revolution in the traditional sense, then clearly no resolution is likely in the foreseeable future. On the other hand, a fuller account of practice reveals a hidden dimension overlooked in the exclusive focus on revolutionary activity. That dimension is the horizontal work of establishing the framework of meaning within which activity goes on. Reification is such a horizon, and so is the de-reifying challenge to it. If changes in that hidden dimension are understood as essentially transformative, then the philosophy of praxis survives the loss of its revolutionary guarantee. The Structure of the Theory Philosophy of praxis is based on a meta-critique of idealist philosophy. Idealism attempted to resolve contradictions between subject and object, value and fact, freedom and necessity, life and thought. The idealist resolution of these antinomies took the form of a speculative play with concepts. Philosophy of praxis demands a real resolution through the practical transformation of the social basis of the antinomies. The meta-critique that establishes the rationale for this approach has three moments. The social reconstitution of idealist categories, the construction of the relations between the reconstituted categories according to the original idealist pattern, and the projection of a resolution of the contradictions between them through social change. The philosophers of praxis argue that abstract philosophical categories are sublimated versions of concrete social realities. The philosophical subject is a sublimated version of the real subject, social class. The object is not being or the thing in itself, but the actual object of social practice. The antinomies reflect fundamental problems of capitalist society. For example, if value and fact stand opposed, this is because the capitalist world is structured by economic laws indifferent to human needs, not because these two domains of being are by nature alien to each other. The antinomies cannot be resolved at the level of pure theory but only by action to change society. Hence Marx's famous dictum, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways, the point is to change it. Philosophy of praxis avoids the crude economic reductionism of which Marxism is often accused by re reconstructing the relations idealism established between its categories as social relations. For example, in the early Marx, labor engages with nature not just technically, but ontology ontologically as the power revealing nature within the social world. 
Similarly, in Lucas, once the philosophical subject is redefined as the proletariat, it is shown to constitute social reality through a process of mediation. In both Marx and Lucas, the idealist co concepts of synthesis, constitution, and mediation are translated as practical relations to nature and society. Adorno and Marcuse's claims for social practice are less ambitious, but even they consider the subject-object and value-fact relations as unities fractured by capitalism. The vaunted, uh, the vaunted objectivity of science and its restricted empiricism is one at the expense of a richer experience of things and their potentialities. The excluded second dimension is reduced to an inner realm of subjective values. This is what gives rise to the philosophical antinomy of value and fact that idealism attempts to overcome speculatively. In his early Metacritique, Marx argues that the antinomies arise from conceptualizing subject and object on the model of cognition. The real subject and object are the worker and nature, not the knower and the known. The worker is more than a cogito, a thinker of thoughts. The subject qua worker is a human being with needs, relating to its objects practically rather than theoretically. These practical relations have the form of the idealist identity of subject and object, although common sense considers needs and satisfactions to be accidentally related like any two objects in the world. Marx argues the contrary, that the subject of need and its objects are essentially related. This is an ontological relation in which both subject and object are constituted. The constituting process is played out in the practical humanization of nature through labor and sense experience. Marx calls this objectification, but under capitalism it takes an alienated form. Despite the fundamental interdependence of human subject and object, laboring is associated with poverty and loss. The subject-object relation is lived in suffering and conflict. Private property and wage labor are historically contingent causes of this lived version of the antinomy. Overcoming these institutional obstacles through revolution can bring about a rational harmony of subject and object no amount of philosophical speculation can achieve. Lucas's Metacritique relates the subject-object concept of idealism to the economic processes analyzed in Marx's mature works. Those works restrict the early Metacritique to a limited social arena and abandon larger philosophical goals. But Lucas recovers Marx's original intent to create a philosophy of praxis. The result differs from Marx's thought in several respects. Lucas lives in a far more advanced society in which vast bureaucracies deploy a scientific, technical production system. The problem of rationality the early Marx addressed with the idea of a socialist reconciliation of man and nature now appears in a different light. Rationality has split in two, one form corresponding to a strictly instrumental relation to human beings and nature, reification, while another dialectical rationality belongs to the transforming practice in which the social and cultural world are revolutionized by the proletariat. No new concept of reason seems able to reconcile them nor can the rule of the assembled producers eliminate the instrumental relation to reality. Reified rationality, rationality predominates under capitalism. Its contradictions are reflected philosophically in, in the antinomies. Lucas formulates all this through an imminent critique of German idealism. He identifies three demands of reason that emerge from idealism's failed attempt to carry out, carry out its program. The principle of practice, history as reality, and dialectical method. They hang together. Practice can only transform reality, i.e. being in the strong philosophical sense of the term, where reality is essentially historical. This historical transformation will take place not through a deterministic mechanism or an unbounded creative process, but through realizing the social potentialities revealed in the tension between the rationalized social forms and individual life processes. The philosophical subject of idealism is replaced by the human subject of work, as in Marx, but Lucas emphasizes the role of that subject in constituting and overthrowing reified social institutions rather than its relation to nature. 
By mediating reification, the historical subject reconciles the antinomies of subject and object, value and fact, freedom and necessity, theory and practice. In both Marx and Lucas, the concept of reason emerges transformed from the metacritique. Its uncritical, alienated, or reified form is replaced or complemented by dialectical rationality. That alternative form of rationality is not another scientific or technical discipline, but the articulation of social experience, social experience raised to consciousness. Now rationality is associated not only with science and experiment, but also with the practical critique coming from those subordinated to the forms of capitalism. Their situated knowledge reveals aspects of reality to which reified rationality is blind. That situated knowledge is granted cognitive status by philosophy of praxis. It is not merely a matter of opinion, but arises from and refers to a real object Marcuse will later identify with the life world. The metacritically reconstructed subject and object of the life world are ultimately real. Theory builds on the critical method imminently present in life-worldly experience, not a pure reason in which philosophy of praxis no longer believes. This view contrasts with the scientific ideology that becomes increasingly influential from Lucas's time down to the present. According to this ideology, experience is essentially flawed and subjective in contrast with the objective understanding of a purified cogito, freed from all bonds of corporality, emotion, and situation. Philosophy of Praxis dismisses this view from nowhere as a reflex of reification and imposes a finite horizon on the cognitive subject. It rejects idealism's thesis of the absolute autonomy of reason and relativizes the claims of naturalism by restricting scientific cognition to a limited aspect of the real. Science too is then interpreted as a social institution situated in a social context. This absolute historicism characterizes all four versions of the philosophy of praxis discussed here. These are some of the main concepts of philosophy of praxis that the Frankfurt School elaborates in very different historical circumstances from Marx and Lucas. Theory and practice are split apart. Horkheimer, Adorno, and Marcuse conclude that no proletarian movement promises to realize the demands of reason and reconcile humanity and nature. The Soviet Union resembles Weber's iron cage of bureaucracy far more than Marx's Paris commune. Instrumental reason has triumphed, and socialist revolution now appears as a lost cause, at least for the foreseeable future. The third moment in the metacritique is beyond reach, yet the first two moments retain their credibility as a critique of idealism and naturalism, and a reconstruct reconstructive alternative. But it is impossible to detach the first two moments entirely from the third. If subject and object have become concrete, active social beings in the world. Their antinomies demand resolution in the world as well. The Frankfurt School struggles with this conundrum. In Adorno, the outcome is dystopian despair in history. He argues that the thought and experience of the individuals in capitalist society have been radically distorted by the commodification of every aspect of social life. Abstract concepts replace a deeper understanding of the connections and potentialities of things. Experience is reduced to a mere reflection of the given, without the imaginative force required for self-reflection. Instrumental rationality, unrestrained by any concept of potentialities and limits, threatens human survival with the increase in its technological power to exploit and destroy. In this critique, one sees the persistence of the ideal of harmony between human being and nature. But now that ideal promises no transformation, it simply devalues the present by contrast. In his late work, Marcuse arrives at a more positive position under the influence of the new left. The new left practices a cultural politics that, while it lacks the power of a proletarian movement, at least goes beyond mere technical manipulation within the existing system. The movement testifies to the continuing possibility of practical critique beyond the one-dimensionality of reified experience under capitalism. 
Radical experience, the new sensibility, is informed by an imaginative grasp of the blocked potentialities of a society that artificially maintains competition, poverty, and war, long after it has become rich and secure enough to dispense with these vestiges of an obsolete reality principle. The cultural movement has political expressions capable of catalyzing a much broader popular movement, as occurred in France in 1968. The unity of theory and practice is not fully restored by this argument, but its promise is renewed. Marcuse is the first philosopher of praxis to respond positively to the growth of technology. He argues that radical change must involve not only social transformation, but also technological transformation. A technology of liberation must be created to replace capitalism's technology of domination. The weak points in Marcuse's formulation are all too obvious today. I identified two principal ones in chapter 8, the reliance on a normative grounding in the affirm affirmation of life, which while intuitively appealing is vague, and the undifferentiated critique of science and technology that leads to the implausible demand for a new science. Nevertheless, despite these problems, Marcuse revives the philosophy of praxis. He succeeds, I believe, in opening up new ways of thinking about technology and experience and the theory-practice relationship that would result from their transformation. The accompanying table shows the main points of similarity between these philosophers. Several things become clear from the table. Adorno is the odd man out because he believes the unity of theory and practice has broken down completely. His position is quite different from the others but he shares enough with them that many of his ideas could serve as inspiration or confirmation of Marcuse's closely re related version of philosophy of praxis. Marcuse believed the results of the breakdown of the unity of theory and praxis were partially compensated by a radical vision shared by critical theory in the movements of the new left. This vision falls short of the unity envisaged by Marx and Lucas but it suffices to overcome Adorno's excessively pessimistic conclusion. I'm not going to read this um, table. But if you want to look at it, it's on page uh, 208. A second point of significance emerges from the table, the variety of solutions to the conundrum of nature and history confronting the philosophy of praxis. Marx's most radical solution devalues the natural sciences as an illusion. He invokes some sort of new science that would transcend current science, just as social socialism would transcend the capitalist economy. But this is quite implausible. The ambition to overthrow capitalism cannot be extended to the scientific basis of modern society. The problem is even more obvious in Lucas. He attempts to extend the revolutionary paradigm to the whole field of rational institutions, including the economy and administ administration, as well as science and technology, and ultimately to rationality as such. But when it comes to proposing a new concept of reason to replace the reified one, he runs into problems. He balks at the consequences of his own concept of mediation. His dialectic presupposes the very reification the revolution is supposed to overcome. The dialectic serves as a placeholder for a new reconciled concept of reason, but it cannot be substituted for the reified rationality embodied in the essential institution, institutions of modernity. That Lucas was aware of the difficulty shows up in his philosophy of science. He treats the formal structure of scientific factuality as intrinsically social, while sparing the contents of natural science from ideology critique. The distinction between genesis and validity diffuses the original Marxian critique of science. Adorno rejects the absolutization of either nature or history, and so does not quite affirm history as reality. Instead of a theory, he proposes a chiasmus. Nature is historical and history is natural. If nature is identified with the struggle for survival, then indeed it has penetrated history in the form of the violent assault of human beings on nature and each other. History is natural insofar as it is based on that struggle. On the other hand, nature is not an eternal given, but evolves as human understanding and technical practice alter its form. 
Marcuse argues that nature is a subject and as such deserves respect. Of course, the nature in question is not that of natural science, but the nature of the life world. He does not anthropomorphize this nature as Habermas charged, but rather attempts to reconstruct the concept of essential potentiality in historical terms. Lived nature belongs to history insofar as it contains potentialities that can be realized by social revolution. In this respect, it contrasts with the merely manip manipulable nature of techno technological rationality. How lived nature is supposed to relate to the nature of natural science is unclear in Marcuse's thought. He is misled by a lingering fidelity to a, co to a concept of revolution that dictates an epistemological transformation when extended to reason as such. He formulates a highly speculative alternative to the dominant understanding of science and argues for the, for the enlargement of scientific reason's scope to encompass the fruits of an aesthetic engagement with reality. It is not easy to concretize this suggestion. Marcuse's position makes more sense in its, uh, its application to technology. The application of aesthetic criteria and the imaginative construction of the potentialities implicated in technological design are hardly controversial. Marcuse's critique is aimed at an exclusive emphasis on profitability and power. But although plausible in its general lines, the absence of a clear distinction between science and technology leaves his argument vulnerable to all sorts of critical abuse. Chapter 8 attempts to save Marcuse's contribution by clarifying this issue. The Dialectic of Reason and Experience According to Marxism, the proletariat is the subject of socialist revolution. Marx and Lucas share this notion, and even Adorno and Horkheimer, in their 1956 dialogue, can imagine no other revolutionary agent. Why this emphasis on the proletariat? There are several converging reasons. The spread of technology into the factory transforms work, workers, and the control of production, creating a compact social subject motivated to overthrow the system. Meanwhile, the unfolding dynamic of capitalist crisis makes it ever more difficult to sustain the population, and the emergence of a growing and better informed class of workers promises a democratic alternative to capitalist management of the system. The combination of motivation, crisis, and capacity underpins the classical doctrine of socialist revolution. Unexpectedly, 20th century capitalism in the advanced countries adjusted sufficiently to the threat from below to diffuse revolutionary motivations. At the same time, the spread of technology and management continues to produce resistant, if non-revolutionary subjects in many areas of social life. These dispersed subjects have a tension-filled relation to the reified structures that form them. Out of these tensions come struggles that, whether the participants know it or not, are the direct descendants of the proletarian movements that inspired Marxism. The fact that these struggles have not been totalized in a singular confrontation with capital, the fact that no inevitable economic laws promise victory, all this is obvious today. But history is not ended for that matter. A new paradigm of social change is needed based on the French and Russian revolutions, but on a dial or based not on the French and Russian revolutions, but on a dialectical conception of mediation. I have suggested reasons for this in the discussion of resistance that concludes chapter five. What is left of Marxism under these new conditions? We need to take seriously Lucas's starting, startling assertion at the beginning of history and class consciousness that the essence of Marxism consists not in factual claims, but in dialectical method. By this, he means not only the theoretical method of capital, but the method of practical critique arising in resistance to reified markets, bureaucracies, and technologies. That resistance is ongoing in new forms, if still far weaker than its object, but the fact that it exists at all holds open the utopian possibilities that encouraged Marcuse in his last work to keep the philosophy of praxis alive. If we follow Marcuse in taking these resistances seriously, then we must return to the dialectic for a new approach. It teaches that modern institutions are not substantial things, 
but must be grasped in their contingency on the practices that constitute them. We must also cease thinking about the subject of resistance as a substantial unified agent with stable characteristics and objective interests. Instead, it too must be seen as a relational aspect of the fractured and contradictory unity of the reified institutions that assemble it. Those institutions have multiplied enormously since the days of Marx and now cover the whole surface of modern society with various systems of rational control, including state and corporate administrations, educational and medical institutions, and the media. Even leisure activities are structured by the same hierarchical division. Each such system assembles a latent subject capable of entering into conflict with the institutional base. Modern society is neither a unity nor an aggregate. Rather, it is inherently divided into reified subjects and objects by the systems that found it. These systems are held together in dialectically divided totalities by their rational form. They impose those forms as the basis of social order in every sphere. Their heterogeneous content is never absorbed completely by the forms, nor is it indifferent to the incomplete process of formation imposed on it. The social rationality of those systems is based on specific cognitive achievements natural and social scientific insights that determine coherent configurations of human and natural resources. These are real achievements for the most part, not arbitrary or merely ideological, but, the, but they are under, under determined by rational considerations and biased formally by social interests, primarily by the interests that flow from the capitalist organization of production and, dis and distribution. The nearly total rationalization of modern society entangles social theory with philosophy in unexpected ways. Concepts of will, interest, ideology, and power no longer suffice to understand the rationalized world. Insofar as it has a rational form, it appears to realize universal and necessary laws. And yet its bias is all too clear and gives rise to conflict. What kind of society has the form of an argument, one that is split between rational domination and a lived experience that overflows instrumental boundaries and motivates resistances? Those resistances are the mediations that restructure rational domination, modifying its forms and reducing its power in order to accommodate the interests of the dominated. The essence of the Marxist dialectic is the process of mediation, as exemplified originally by Marx's critique of political economy and the struggles of the labor movement. The socialist movement conceived that process through class struggle because it believed the route to power led through the factory. This obscured the cognitive aspect of mediation and gave rise to unrealistic revolutionary expectations. <clears throat> Marxists believed they could create a socialist society by decommodifying the economy and substituting state planning for private ownership of capital. But the overthrow of capitalism does no more than inaugurate a new phase in the struggle with reification. Lucas is more aware of this fact than most of his contemporaries. He envisages a long-term struggle rather than a brief and decisive coup. But he equivocates on the role of reification after the revolution. Lucas knows that no modern society can function without structures. The revolution cannot, therefore, institute a society in which all institutions are dissolved into temporary political arrangements. At one point, he suggests the possibility of a new kind of non-reified stabilization. But this suggestion is not developed beyond a brief note. I wonder if he had any idea what post-revolutionary structures would be like, if not some version of the market bureaucracy and technology evolved under capitalism. Workers' councils might choose managers instead of boards of directors, and economic planning might replace the banking system, but these modifications of the capitalist inheritance do not abolish reification, root and branch. Under socialism at best, reified institutions would no longer be as well armored against change from below as under capitalism. 
This conception of socialism has political implications. The conflictual interactions in which most mediation consists can only flourish in a democracy. The contestation in which the process of mediation goes on presupposes respect for basic democratic principles, human rights, and the will of the majority. It thus follows that socialism must be democratic, a conclusion that finds support in Marx's enthusiastic description of the Paris Commune. Furthermore, socialism must be a deep democracy in which all forms of rational order and not just law are subject to de-reification and transformation. We already have significant examples of democratic interventions that prefigure a different regime of rationality. Struggles over technology must clearly illustrate the challenge to reification. In addition to continuing class conflict over technological innovation in production, Many types of protest have emerged in recent years around environmental and medical issues and the internet. Demonstrations, lawsuits, hearings, and forums have turned environmentalism into a political issue and transformed public awareness of medical research. Online protests over control of the internet and hacking have created a new information politics. Most remarkable is occasional lay participation in the work of scientific experimentation and technical design. Although their scope and effectiveness are still severely limited, interventions such as these enlarge the public, public sphere and anticipate a more democratic form of modern society. Yet they have been systematically underestimated and ignored by political theorists. Where they are noticed at all, resistances are generally viewed not dialectically, but from the one-sided perspective of the dominant. From that perspective, rationality stands opposed to, ignor to ignorance and disorder. But the reality is quite different. Rational domination is biased not only by the usual errors, prejudices, and traditions that threaten everything human beings think and do, but by two problems of principle that stem from the very nature of reification and require democratic correction. These problems have to do with specialization and control. Everything is connected in the real world, but reification differentiates the totality into fragmented parts. Disciplinary specializations follow the reified pattern in isolating particular cross sections of the totality for analytical treatment. The cognitive advantages of specialization are undeniable but it can lead to unanticipated problems in the application. For example, not infrequently, engineers design a production process or a device that is hazardous for the workers who use it. Once it is deployed, medical complications ensue, and another specialization must be called in to deal with non-engineering aspects of the concrete system formed by the device and the worker's physiology. In the best of cases, the combination of specializations initiates in an in, in iterative, iterative design process that resolves the problems. Who is likely to first notice the limitations of the engineer's useful but narrow conception of reality? There is no meta-discipline able to predict the need to integrate multiple forms of disciplinary knowledge. Another source of knowledge must come into play knowledge from below based on real-world experience. Such knowledge is frequently occasioned by overlooked harms of technology or unexploited technical potentials that have not been identified by the technologists themselves, but which users can imagine and even in some cases implement on their own. The chief contemporary examples of these two categories are the medical harms of industrial pollution, and the communicative potentials of the internet. There's a second systemic problem with reification, the challenge of control. This is reason's original sin. Technical control of human beings leads to decisions that inspire resistance, not just for contingent motives, but structurally, necessarily. Consider, for example, the dilemma of capitalist management that must keep up with technological advances while reproducing its control of a more or less antagonistic labor force. These twin requirements have determined the technical code of capitalism based on authoritarian management, de-skilling, and automation. 
alternative and more humane paths of progress have been foreclosed, and this pattern has been generalized to other social domains. For example, the politics of energy is biased by the imperative requirement of energy companies to enlarge their centrally controlled grids. Alternative sources of energy and conservation have been marginalized. The internet originated in a decentralized logic, but, to, but today is in the grip of struggles over control that threaten to bring it into conformity with the general pattern. The point is not to argue for the dissolution of all these rationalized systems, but the extent of centralization and its consequences are very much worth questioning. Resistance to heavy-handed controls and inhumane policies leads to conflicts and eventually to restructuring domination in less oppressive forms. This is not a conventional political process. Democratic interventions must be translated by technical professionals into new regulations and designs. Struggle gives rise to new technical codes, both for particular types of, of artifacts and even for whole technological domains. This is an essential form of activism in a rationalized society. It limits the autonomy of experts in capitalist management and forces them to redesign the worlds they create to represent a wide, wider range of interests. The translated demands are assimilated by the institutions and may lead in turn to future iterations of the struggle, further contestation. This is the logic of reification and mediation, and it is insurpassable. I call it democratic rational rationalization because it reproduces rational institutions in response to pressure from below. Transforming Praxis The contemporary relevance of the concept of practice developed in these pages should be the subject of another book, but I do want to offer some tentative thoughts here in conclusion. What I have called transforming practice is characterized by the following, following attributes. One, transforming practice is aimed at meaning. Two, meaning is not subjective, but is enacted in practice and raised to consciousness. Three, meanings are entangled with each other in a cultural system that forms the horizon of thought and action. Four, insofar as it is enacted, culture ha has system effects that are more or often less intended consciously by social actors. Five, culture does not exhaust social reality but stands in tension with the forces it evokes. In what follows, I will summarize the formulations of this concept in Marx, Lucas, and the Frankfurt School, and consider how it might be applied to contemporary social movements. We have seen how Marx and Lucas attempt to break through the barrier of alienated and reified cultural forms to a reflexive concept of transforming practice. Their attempts establish the foundations of philosophy of praxis, but also lead to an exaggerated notion of activity. In Marx's manuscripts, practice takes on the creative power of the divinity. Untransformed nature is treated as mere matter awaiting the human touch. In Lucas's history and class consciousness, an ambiguity hangs over the concept of subject-object identity. In a metaphysical reading, it signifies the supremacy of the subject over all being. But when I call a methodological, but in what I call a methodological or dialectical reading, his concept of mediation has much in common with the Frankfurt School's concept of non-identity. This ambiguity is discussed in chapter six. Paradoxically, the Frankfurt School's emphasis on the liberating implications of reflection and restraint make possible a deeper understanding of transforming practice. The notion of a non-exploitative relation to nature is too easily caricatured as hippie nonsense, the flower child's anthem. But the philosophers of the Frankfurt School do not advocate abandoning the idea of activity central to the Marxist conception of human being. Rather, they attempt to conceptualize a different kind of activity that respects the object as bearer of potentialities as possessed of a certain wholeness or self-relation. The previous chapter discussed this concept of the object in relation to nature, but it obviously applies also to human beings. To achieve such respect requires a break with the dominant instrumentalist conception of practice. Marcuse conceives the alternative as an aesthetic or erotic world relation. 
it too is a kind of practice, a self and world transforming practice of the sort imagined in earlier philosophy of praxis, but left implicit in the emphasis on revolutionary activity. This implicit practice appears passive since it is not characterized by manipulation and control, but it nevertheless has an effect on the world through a politics of meaning that, as Lucas argues, alters the functional place of objects in the totality. Even reified practice contains such a non-instrumental moment, a moment in which a horizon of meaning is posited under which the active work of change goes on. In his prescient reflections on technology, Francis Bacon famously defined the relation between this special type of passiv passivity and activity, writing, nature to be commanded must be obeyed. The technical actor must obey the commands of nature, its laws. He can use the laws for his own ends, but to do so he must accept them. This could very well serve as an uncritical definition of reification. In their implicit self-understanding under capitalism, the individuals define themselves as individuals rather than as members of a collective. This is the horizon they posit and under which they generally act. As a result, they cannot act together. Their command of society is strictly limited by obedience to the individualist capitalist framework that serves as the law of their practice. Peace Bacon, this framework is not natural. Following Ian Angus, we can say it is instituted. He suggests an expanded meaning of institution in which it refers to the opening of a space from which new temporal order comes forth and applies both to a formation of knowledge and an epoch of being. This, descri this describes reification as an a priori basis of thought and action. The worst harms of reification arise not from the instituting moment per se, but from its systematic misconstruction in class society as an ontological principle beyond all mediation by the subject. Thus, practice is narrowed to its overtly active dimension, while the establishment of its horizon is conceptualized con contemplatively as an unchangeable objectivity to which human beings must adapt. Since reified practice cannot act on its horizon, the more vigorous its exertions, the more effectively it reproduces the very framework of assumptions within which it is condemned to operate. But this is not a fateful necessity. A non-instrumental action transforming the horizon is possible. Philosophy of praxis recognizes horizontal transformation in this sense, but that creates a certain tension with the Marxist concept of revolution. In what does transforming practice most essentially consist? Action on the horizon of action or the action made possible by that action? Which practice fulfills the requirements of the principle of practice and resolves the antinomies, material semiotic change, or power political change? The Frankfurt School resolves the ambiguity in emphasizing the aesthetic, a domain of activity in which the horizon is the essential object of action. With this emphasis, it invokes a power more radical and thoroughgoing than anything dreamed up by industry or politics, what Adorno calls a pacified technique. The Frankfurt School's emphasis on aesthetics is overly narrow but suggestive. The instituting moment of practice is most clearly a conscious and purposeful mediation in the case of aesthetics. This is so for several reasons. Aesthetic practice begins by freely positing a form as a horizon of the ordinary instrumental actions through which the work is created. The imaginative freedom characteristic of aesthetic practice enables idealizing strategies that signify unfulfilled potentialities of the social world. This is accomplished through the way in which the form incorporates aspects of the materials and is thus not simply imposed, but is in some sense emergent. As Lucas argues, the aesthetic form content relation is dialectical. Concept and object interact productively. One way of understanding this interaction is in terms of a limit, the independent logic of the, logic of the object to which the form must adapt in forming its materials. Marcuse generalizes these aspects of aesthetics beyond the realm of art. He conceives a technical practice that resembles art making, art making in revealing 
potentialities and respecting its materials. In reaction against an overactive instrumentalism, he even proposes letting be as an ideal. Here, the notion of limit is carried to the limit. This makes sense in an aesthetic context. I have found it most clearly exemplified by aspects of Japanese culture. It is beautifully anticipated in a Japanese Buddhist tale that has a particular relevance to this discussion because it concerns a reconciled technology. The swords of the legendary maker ok Okazaki Masamune. This account is from D.T. Suzuki. Masamune flourished in the latter part of the Kamakura era, and his works are uniformly prized by all the sword connoisseurs for their excellent qualities. As far as the edge of the blade is concerned, Ma Masamune may not exceed Muramasa, one of his ablest disciple, disciples or disciplines. But Masamune is said to have something morally inspiring that comes from his personality. The legend goes thus. When someone was trying to test the sharpness of a Muramasa, he placed it in a current of water and watched how it acted against the dead leaves flowing downstream. He saw that every leaf that met the blade was cut in twain. He then placed a Masamune, and he was surprised to find that the leaves avoided the blade. The Masamune was not bent on killing, it was more than a cutting implement, whereas the Muramasa could not go beyond cutting. There was nothing divinely inspiring in it. The Muramasa is terrible. The Masamune is humane. One is despotic and imperialistic. The other is superhuman, if we may use this form of expression. This tale is the mythological expression of transforming practice. The feeling that such a concept is self-contradictory only testifies to the persistent influence of reification. In the parable, the sword that cuts annihilates its object only to find another in the perpetual flow of the stream. Masamune's sword is the more powerful because it acts not on things, on leaves or men, but on the horizon of its own practice, the assumption that killing is an inevitable fate. The idea of letting be or reconciliation as a positive mediation and a true positing appears in Japanese culture in the more familiar form of borrowed scenery. The architectural style that leaves trees standing as natural ornaments of the house is as much a mediation of nature as a different style that begins by leveling them. From an aesthetic standpoint, the living trees are as purely chosen and incorporated into the lives of human beings as if they had been clear cut to make way for a real estate development. Yet their independence as subjects facing the human subject is not overthrown by a violent identification. What is more, the letting be of the trees shows respect not only for outer nature, but also for that which in human nature requires trees. It, it, is, it is as much nature in the subject as without that is mediated in this reconciled practice. For whatever human beings do to another, they simultaneously do to themselves in another mode. That is, in effect, the defining trait of a finite being. This approach to practice may seem remote from, from Marxism, and certainly the concept of aesthetic practice, even generalized as it is in Marcuse, cannot fully explain radical political movements. But the emphasis on horizontal change is an implicit aspect of traditional Marxist politics. Marxism addresses not particular wrongs, but the generalized wrong of capitalist civilization as a whole. A totalizing critique emerges through the positing of a horizon. That horizon is the life process of the proletariat, damaged by alienation and commodification. Marxism begins with the categorical imperative to overthrow all conditions in which man is a degraded, enslaved, neglected, contemptible being. This imperative establishes a limit. Action begins in respect for the humanity of the worker. The law of that humanity commands the overthrow of all that violates it. A similar correlation of passivity and activity defines class consciousness in Lucas. The prior condition of struggle is the self-consciousness of the commodity. 
In it, the worker posits her own needs as a limit violated by the commodification of labor. Unfulfilled needs motivate resistance, not just to poverty, but to its cause, the reification of the worker's own self. This self, too, is a kind of nature to be defended against capitalist clear-cutting. That defense is the source of the revolutionary act that overthrows the system. It begins with a self-transformation that is itself a social transformation. Clearly, these Marxist uh, conceptions of practice go beyond Marcuse's letting be, and even Marcuse only mentions this notion to emphasize the contrast between emancipatory technique and the dominant exploitative instrumentalism. The link between meaning and enactment implies active engagement with reality, even, even if in the extreme case of letting be, that engagement takes the form of adjustment to the independent potentialities of the materials. More commonly, activism involves overt in interventions into social and political processes. What characterizes such interventions as transformative is not the degree of violence that ex they exhibit, but their relation to the, to the totality, i.e. to the cultural system as a whole. The Marxist conception of practice depends on a specific historical confi configuration of the proletariat, but its structure survives changes in that configuration. The underlying problem Lucas attempts to solve with the, his notion of class consciousness is the possibility of to totalizing critique. Since critical agency is itself empowered by the system it criticizes, is there not a contradiction in its stance? This was the insuperable obstacle in Horkheimer and Adorno's futile dialogue. The answer Lucas proposes is the dialectic of form and content. A modified version of that dialectic applies even after the decline of the revolutionary proletariat. Societies impose forms on contents they activate and shape, evoke and channel. There's no guarantee that the forms will effectively contain the contents. The culture of rule in every society addresses the gaps with prescriptions and solutions of various sorts, such as religious ideology and administrative initiatives. The conditions of critique are fulfilled where tensions between form and content become conscious as such, as such at the level of content i.e. the subordinate social actors. Then a resistant subjectivity forms and counter ideologies and initiatives challenge the system. Lucas identifies this unique situation with capitalism and its proletariat. We now know that it has a wider reach. Although we do not have many equivalents today of the militant class struggles that inspired Marx and Lucas, a deep transformation of the horizon of contemporary practice is gradually emerging. This transformation takes place in scattered regions of society in response to a critical awareness of the harms of a destructive way of life. Awareness liberates the individuals for political activity most visibly in movements around gender issues, struggles against, struggles against exclusion, the environmental movement, and the defense of the internet against commercial domination, surveillance, and censorship. Economic and environmental crises weaken the grip of reification. The horizon of practice shifts with the realization of the contingency of the world created by technocratic neoliberalism. The movements to which this gives rise are still quite weak and lack an overall strategy of change. They do not fulfill the conditions of revolution as Lucas explains them. But the unfavorable comparison with earlier proletarian movements should not blind us to subtle changes taking place in the conduct of politics and the nature of the public sphere that may yet shape a new era. Of the figures discussed here, Marcuse understood, his, understood this best. He proposed two different strategies in the struggle against the one-dimensional society. The great, the great refusal was an aesthetic principle generalized as a total rejection of the system. This strategy recapitulated old debates that opposed reform to revolution. Uncompromising and absolute critique was an attractive stance in the context of a dystopian society, rich enough to co-opt every demand in any case. 
But ironically, the search for the uncooptable demand led to Marcuse himself becoming an icon in the mass culture of 1968, a fact from which his reputation suffers to this day. A new configuration emerged in the 1970s that Marcuse called the preventative counter-revolution. Co-optation co -optation continued, but became supplemented by recession and repression. The new left disintegrated, but left behind a large critical public and a sense of suppressed possibilities. Marcuse now echoed the German slogan, a long march through the institutions. In a time of political eclipse, one must find a place in the institutions of, of society. I have hiccups. <clears throat> but it is still possible to bring contestation to bear on those institutions accepting the likely ambiguity of the outcome. Demanding the overthrow of the system is not the touchstone, touchstone of resistance it might be in a time of revolutionary ferment. These two strategies exemplify two different versions of the dialectic. The great refusal is a disappointed response to the failure of the metaphysical version in which a substantialized revolutionary agent such as the proletariat resolves the contradictions and establishes a socialist, state, a socialist state. The long march reflects the dialectic of permanent mediation of rational institutions by their members. I argue for the disruptive thesis, disruptive for traditional Marxism, that is, that only the second version makes sense today as a theory of progressive social change. The system as a whole is not an object of resistance at this time, and may only become so in the future through the horizontal changes underlying contemporary resistances, challenging fundamental assumptions and institutions. Thus, these resistances are neither revolutionary nor reformist in the usual sense of the term. They differ from minor reforms internal to the normal functioning of the institutions, since they restructure the context within which the system operates. This too is a kind of transforming practice that affects the, the totality. For want of a better term, I will call them radical reforms. They are not to be conceived as merely deficient by comparison with true revolutionary practice. Even if the system could be abolished, many reified institutions would continue to exist and inspire resistances and radical reforms similar to those we see today. Traditional Marxism recognized this reality to some extent. It supported the growth of a labor movement demanding economic reforms, and it proposed a gradual transition to socialism. But labor struggle and the transition were conceived as temporary phenomena, the one preparing the revolution and the other following it, and ending with the advent of communism. In reality, reform and transition are always already engaged in modern society and will never end. They are inherent in the structure of modernity, not just in a particular economic system. The failure to recognize this has doomed revolutions in the name of socialism. Having overthrown capitalism, they reproduced its reifying consequences in other institutional forms, while blocking mediation in the name of the revolution. The contemporary significance of the philosophy of praxis appears clearly in the light of this history.